Hello everyone and welcome back to Chemistry Time. In today's discussion we are going to be learning about the periodic table, going into a little bit more detail about average atomic mass and ice isotopes. We have a lot to cover so let's jump right in. The modern day periodic table has undergone a number of revisions since its first design, but its layout and organization are credited to Dmitry Mendeleev. In contrast with what Dalton's theory believed, the difference between atoms of different elements comes down to the number of protons in the nucleus, not its mass. Each element will have a different number of protons and all atoms of the same element will have the same number of protons, and this is referred to as the atomic number. For example, oxygen has an atomic number of 8, meaning every atom of oxygen has 8 protons. Atoms also have a specific mass number, which is the sum of the number of protons and the neutrons in an atom and is given in atomic mass units, or AMU, where protons and neutrons each have a mass of 1 AMU. It is important to point out that different atoms of the same element may have different mass numbers. These are known as isotopes and will have the same number of protons, but have different number of neutrons. Here we can see the modern periodic table. The elements on the periodic table are ordered by atomic number starting with hydrogen which has an atomic number of 1 and are numbered from left to right. As you can see, the periodic table is separated into rows which are known as periods and periodic columns are referred to as groups. Some of these groups also have special names that we can use to refer to them. For example, group 1 is known as the alkali metals with the exception of hydrogen. Group 2 are the alkaline earth metals, and group 17, also known as 7A, is known as the halogens. An important observation about groups is that the elements in the same group tend to have similar chemical properties. For example, group 18, or 8A, is known as the noble gases, and all of the elements in this group are inert, meaning they don't usually react with other elements. The periodic table also can be separated into different sections based on type. Elements on the left side of the periodic table are metals and are further separated into transition metals with the lanthanide and actinide metals at the bottom. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity and are malleable, meaning that they can be hammered or, or under pressure can be reshaped. If we keep moving right, we hit the metalloids, or also known as semi-metals, which form a staircase shape. Metalloids are commonly used as semiconductors because they have properties in between those of metals and nonmetals. Finally, we have the nonmetals, which are located on the far right side of the periodic table, with the exception of hydrogen. Nonmetals are not good conductors of heat and electricity and are very dull in coloration. When it comes to individual elements, the periodic table can tell us quite a lot, as we have already mentioned. Most periodic tables contain at least three pieces of information for each element. First, it tells us the chemical symbol for that element, which is denoted by one or two letters. Second, it tells us the atomic number, which, as we previously discussed, indicates the number of protons in each atom of that element. Finally, we have the atomic mass, which is the sum of each isotope times its abundance and represents the average atomic mass of that element. Isotopic abundance is the fraction or percent of that isotope in which it is naturally found. When referring to an atom or isotope, there are certain no notations we can use to specify the atom we are referring to. We start off by writing the chemical symbol, then the atomic number, often denoted as Z, as a subscript to the left, and finally the mass number often denoted by A as a superscript to the left. An alternative to this notation is to write the element name with the mass number hyphenated at the end, such as with magnesium 24 or magnesium 25. This format allows us to quickly identify which element we are looking at and allows us to easily determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Remember that every atom of magnesium will have exactly 12 protons, hence the atomic number of 12. In a neutral atom, the number of protons and electrons are equal so that there will always be 12 electrons. Finally, we can determine the number of neutrons by finding the difference between the number of protons and the mass number. So magnesium 24 would have 12 neutrons, while magnesium 25 would have 13 neutrons. Now you must be wondering how we measure the atomic mass of an atom. 
Well, the most direct and accurate way is to use an instrument known as a mass spectrometer. When you introduce your sample in the gaseous state into the instrument, it isn't bombarded with electrons. The reason it is heavily bombarded is to dislodge any electrons to produce a positively charged species known as a cation. These ions are then accelerated. Keep in mind that isotopes of the same element have different masses. This ratio of mass to charge plays a role in how we can determine the atomic weight of an atom. As these ions are accelerated, they are passed through a magnetic field and are deflected on that mass to charge ratio, and we can determine their atomic weight. We cannot calculate absolute atomic mass, so instead we can calculate relative masses by using a reference standard that has already been arbitrarily arbitrarily assigned a value. This is not an uncommon thing to do. Carbon-12 isotope has been assigned the arbitrary standard and is used for most calculations. As a review, today we discussed the parts of the periodic table and its arrangements. We also discussed atomic mass and how it's calculated. Finally, we went over isotopes, atomic notations, and how we can use them to determine the number of subatomic particles in an atom. Hopefully you enjoyed today's discussion and join us next on the next episode of Chemistry Time. Have a wonderful day. Chemistry.